Welcome to Your Best Life. This is episode number five, and I have with us Jeremy Wolf, also known as Solar Moon. That's his DJ name. Uh, before we get the show started today, I just wanted to share the quote of the day with you. Um, Let us always meet each other with a smile, for a smile is the beginning of love. And that's a quote by Mother Teresa, and I think it really speaks to Jeremy and, and his, um, his great smile and his love that he always gives to people in the community. Um, so Jeremy's a, a yoga and meditation instructor, a Reiki master, a DJ, music producer. He's actually a label DJ um, for Ultime Records in France and Ogni Moon Records uh, here in the U.S. and Chile. Um, Jeremy's been uh, into mind-body uh, uh, since a young age, and he actually started out with a, a second-degree black belt in Taekwondo uh, and uh, a teacher uh, also of, uh, I'm going to hopefully say it right, Capoeira. So Jeremy can correct me later. Uh, meditation was his doorway to yoga, and he's been studying since 1998. Um, he has a 200-hour teaching certificate uh, from India in classical yoga and a 500-hour certificate, uh, certificate with uh, Rod Stryker for para yoga. And he's certified um, to teach yoga nidra as well, which I can't wait to touch on in our interview. Um, he leads um, workshops and immersions all over the world, and he leads 205-hour um, teacher training programs uh, throughout the country. Um, and he's based right here in Colorado, um, and he has a family uh, and, and is his son that I hope to learn a little bit more about on this interview as well. So um, thanks for being on the show, Jeremy. Thanks for having me, Eric. Great to yeah. be here. Cool, man. So, you know, this is called Your Best Life Today, and it's all about, um, you know, tips, suggestions, sharing stuff that uh, may help people to be more happy, more peaceful. And uh, let's just jump in with some uh, some questions. <laughs> so um, I thought we could start off with uh, Americans. I don't want to generalize too much, but they tend to go pretty damn fast. And a lot of people, I think, are drawn to yoga um, or meditation because they sense something's a little off. Maybe they're not seeing their family enough. Maybe they're working way too hard. Uh, they can't slow down. And they say, uh, I'm going to try this yoga thing. Because my friend does yoga, and he seems like he's a little more calm. Uh, and then they get into yoga, though, and a lot of yoga um, can actually push you to go pretty fast, too. Um, a lot of the asana yoga, if you relate to it that way. Uh, so I've always been blown away by um, the fact you share yoga nidra. And uh, it, it feels like the antidote to the American rushing around. And I was just hoping, you know, you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why are you so passionate about yoga nidra? And, and uh, you know, what's that all about? Well, that's, I'm grateful you asked me that because, and it's interesting that you use the word antidote because I use that word a lot in referring to yoga nidra. And I talk about a lot of the meditation and yoga practices that emphasize more of a parasympathetic response, the relaxation, the nourishing, the resting, and the slowing down. And this most certainly is the context for the practice of yoga nidra. Um, why I'm so passionate about it, it just happens to be the first practice of yoga that I was ever exposed to, and that was way back in 1993. feels way back in any way for me. <laughs> but um, that's what brought me to yoga, and I didn't know much about the practice. I just loved it and practiced it three to four times a week just because I liked where I went. And when I came back from this sort of in-between wake and sleep state, I came back feeling very clear, refreshed, and more aware. I just noticed the way I was moving through life um, was changing. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea why. And, you know, you're very right. Our culture is, is all about uh, motion, activity, doing, and productivity, and, and the end result, and goal orientation, for sure. And this keeps us in a perpetual state of movement. And we recognize that our, our, our culture, and for many of us, our lives aren't balanced, and they don't feel balanced, and we need balance. And the balance isn't the trying to keep up with what's happening, um, but it's actually the slowing down from what's happening. And I think people are really starting to recognize that that's what's missing in our culture, um, largely, is that we haven't emphasized slowing down, rest, stillness. Um, to just sit and be still and enjoy the moment is almost seen as um, without value because, well, what, what, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. Why, why would you not do anything? particularly in yoga nidra, you know, sometimes when people are first exposed to it, they're like, so I just come in and lie down. 
well, why, why would I do that? Why, you know, I need to sweat and move. And like, isn't, isn't that what yoga is about? And well, it's both. Um, but the lying down is that we can allow the momentum of all of our unconscious habits, all of the um, patterns of conditioning and ways of operating that perpetuate states of stress and anxiety and imbalance and inability to, inability to focus to actually slow down. And in that slowing down, there's a, a, a much deeper dimension to awareness that starts to emerge. And we can start relating to our world um, much differently. So if someone hasn't done Yoga Nidra before, I caught that they lie down when they come in. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it's like to do a, a Nidra class? And what does sure. nidra, Yoga Nidra mean? Typically, yeah, the word Nidra actually means sleep. And so Yoga Nidra is a practice of yogic sleep. But the implication is that it's conscious sleep. It's not unconscious sleep. It's the recognition that we can take the body and mind into profound states of relaxation and even reach the slowest states of brain waves that equate with dreaming and deep sleep uh, being the, the slowest. Uh, and in that state, we can still remain conscious. So what we do in the practice, typically I, I'll have some preparation techniques which are start to facilitate a parasympathetic response in the mind and body to where people will come in. We'll probably do some mild asana, you know, a simple practice of postures. We'll work with breath and particularly the exhale, um, emphasizing and lengthening the exhale to really start to slow down the processes in the body. And we can more effectively transition people who might be just getting off work and uh, at the other end of a traffic jam and now rushing into a class where they need a bit of transition. So transition can be very helpful, especially for people that have trouble just sitting still or being still. Hmm. Using some simple yogic techniques to prepare for it uh, can be very helpful. And then the practice of yoga nidra itself is usually done lying on the back, um, even with props and supported, so you're completely comfortable. And it's with eyes closed. You could, you could compare it to a guided meditation. The whole sequence is guided. There's moments, and in some cases, some extended periods of silence where people can um, move into a deeper awareness of the technique or where the techniques are pointing. But typically, it's just a passive practice for the most part um, that's completely guided. I, I cue people through a very elaborate sequence that takes people from physical body awareness and, and external world awareness into um, the deepest states of internal awareness, calm, and ultimately peace that lies beneath all the layers of agitation and conflict that, that we usually identify with. Sounds pretty great. I um, Slowing down. <laughs> I've been on this path for 15 years, meditation and yoga, and I just had my teacher tell me, Eric, just go sit and look out the window for an hour a day and do nothing. And I, um, I thought, oh, that sounds nice. And it was actually the hardest uh, instruction I've ever gotten. And what I didn't realize is I, I'm sure a lot of uh, the people listening or watching maybe can relate. Um, you know, even if they do have a, an ongoing yoga practice, it might just be something else you do and you fit into your life. So, oh, I gotta, I gotta go to work. I gotta take care of the kids. I, got, I gotta go to yoga class. I gotta do my 10 minute meditation. And it's, it's another doing. And I am um, sitting there looking out the window. Whoa, man, the thoughts were coming up, you know, racing. I was attaching to the thoughts, all the, all the to-dos and the lists. Um, I, I'd love to hear more about slowing down and the value of it, um, you know, from your side. You know, that's excellent advice. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the things that I recommend to people. An hour can be a lot for people, um, but, but to somehow access a place where there's some degree of stillness in the mind. It might not be empty, it might not be completely still. Thoughts are most of the time present, but a space uh, or a time to, to set up a time where you can access space. Um, I think Eckhart Tolle refers to it very, very clearly when he talks about what he calls um, object consciousness and space consciousness. Object consciousness is, that, is just that we have a tendency to always focus on things. And in the context of our culture, we, we're, we're doing culture. And 
anything that we put into that pot of doing tends to be more doing. And yoga becomes this thing that we check off our list. Um, and we're even in a state of actively moving mentally or physically in many cases in yoga, in yoga practice. But the value of accessing a pause, a pause between actions, a pause between breaths, a pause between thoughts uh, is huge. Because again, we're, uh, we operate in a way that we're identified with the things of the world. And we're always seeking happiness from those things. And there's very little self-inquiry in our culture or self-reflection and I'm not just saying, you know, the modes of operation or the choices that I'm making or what I'm accomplishing or not accomplishing in my life, but, but a deeper sense of self. You know, who is this that's expressing? Who is this that's trying to accomplish these things? And is, is lasting happiness really going to be found through temporary things? We've spent our whole lives trying to work that equation and we've found that it doesn't actually work. Temporary happiness can come through temporary things. But the stillness allows us to drop into a state of presence. And not just, oh, I'm aware of what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm not trying to fulfill any particular agenda just for this moment. And I'm just appreciating the gift of breath or these five senses or that I'm in a body that there is this extremely, extremely elaborate system that's so much more than thinking of myself as, well, I'm a, I'm a person living in a city, but instead more I'm a human being um, as, a, as a vehicle for consciousness or intelligence or creative expression that's living on a planet, that's living in the universe, that, that has a, a, a much bigger context than just you know, what I have etched into my schedule seven days a week. And stillness gives us, or silence, or meditation, or reflection, even in nature, just to sit in nature and just appreciate what's there, rather than thinking, well, what's wrong with this? What needs to change? I need to add something, or I need to take something away. But instead, just appreciate the moment as it is. Um, if we start to disidentify with this momentum of unconscious patterning that drives us forward, which can either be supportive or unsupportive. So what would you say to someone who um, feels like they're not valuable if they're not doing? Do we actually, I mean, can we have faith that we will be valuable if we're not so busy doing all the time? Right. Where we place value is a little misdirected for the most part. Um, we place value on, on things that are ultimately fleeting, which is fine, but ultimately we determine the value of our world, um, whether that be family, whether that be possessions, whether that be profession or status. I think the, the, the danger in applying value to certain things is that we inherently then devalue other things. And the more preferences we develop throughout the course of our lives, the things that we value might get narrower and the things that we devalue broadens. And now we're looking for that very bright or vivid, vivid or vibrant experience, that great accomplishment, that large possession that you know, social recognition or whatever it is that says, oh, I, I, I am good enough or I, I, I am valuable, rather than recognizing the value of each moment, of each experience, of each sensation. You know, we lose touch with the value of having the human experience because we're looking for very specific experiences which have us overlook all the rest. Yeah. So, um, for this culture, you, you know, my view is that it's going pretty fast. Say um, someone listening to this show starts to slow down a little bit. They have their practice. They start to appreciate, you know, the, the moments with their family, that with just being on their own in nature, like you said. 
Um, do you have any, any tricks or tips on prioritizing your life in a way that honors that or maybe, um, yeah, like just, just um, not to get pulled into the busyness of our culture. Like I, I know when I tried to set this interview up with you, I called you and I said, hey, can you do it next week? And you said, next week I'm going deep into my practice and I'm dedicated to spending time with my family. And it, it was like the most beautiful thing I, I'd heard in a long time. And, um, you know, that it sounds like you're really taking a stand to to protect what's important to you as a practitioner. And, you know, I think everyone can relate to that, that, you know, the demands on their time in this culture. So, you know, what have you set up and put in place? What would you recommend? Well, again, we live in a culture where our greatest value is on the future. It's on the promise that whatever is wrong with this moment will eventually be fixed. And in that moment, I'll allow myself to be happy. I'll allow myself to experience a state of contentment or fulfillment because I'll finally have achieved that thing or fixed that thing or released that thing or solved that thing. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is that it's, it's, we're simply deceiving ourselves out of being happy now. Um, we place value on a moment that ultimately doesn't exist. And by nature, um, going back to one of my previous points, we now devalue the present moment, which is the moment where everything's happening, the moment where life is happening, the only moment, in fact, of course, where life is happening. And if we don't value that, if we're compromising the quality of our experience of this moment, well, eventually, w what's left is little time. When we realize, gosh, I did achieve this or that, and well, my happiness lasted a little while, but that wore off because desire is endless. Desire is completely endless. So we're perpetually seeking the future. So the key is absolutely to um, step into the sacredness that's inherent in the present moment, which is, which is valuing everything about it, that it's so completely fantastic and incredible. Um, and we... You know, all of that comes from our tendency, which is from the mind, which is its job, which labels things. So we label things, and as soon as we label something, we now frame it as a concept in the mind, and we distance ourselves from that very experience. Um, as soon as I label a tree, I often stop paying attention to the tree, not even really looking at the essence of the tree or experiencing it, but I'm now just living out, oh yeah, that tree reminds me of that tree from my grandma's house as a child or something like that. So it's, it's not that everyone needs to meditate, though great recommendation <laughs> will definitely change your life, but to slow down um, to experience stillness. And some of the ways that I recommend doing it, one is breath awareness. And breath awareness starts to, if you allow it, take you into the experience of the present moment. It's not this concept of the present moment that is somehow always a means to an end, um, but that there's this infinite realm of sensations and experiences that we can have just by going deeper into this moment. And so breath, um, I would even say, a very simple breath you can do is practice breathing um, and lengthening your exhale. A longer exhale than inhale is going to start to facilitate that parasympathetic response. It's going to start to lessen the momentum of this constant chasing or seeking outside of the present moment so that we can actually land here and at least temporarily arrive here and enjoy it here, um, really appreciate it here. So something as simple as closing your eyes, and you don't even have to do that. You could do this traveling in your car, but lengthening your exhale, make it longer, and just feel the effect that it's creating while it's happening. Breath is one of the most profound and fastest ways to shift our physiological and psychological experience. And we can do it instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So that would be one suggestion for how can I slow down? How can I disengage from the need to not be here? Um, that would be one way. And a common practice across meditation, predict, uh, meditation traditions and yoga tradition is the practice of witness awareness. And it's really just 
being with what's present without acting or thinking for or against it. This is good, I want more of it. This is bad, I need to get away from it. Can I just be with what's present? And a simple way to do that that I, that I often encourage people to use is access your senses. Not you know, what we usually do when we access our senses is for, oh, I like that sensation, I want more, I'll reach for more of that, or oh, I don't like that, I need to get away. But just be present, place your attention. You know, so as I spoke before, Typically, we, we have an experience, we have information that flows in through the senses, then the mind creates a concept about it, then the experience that we have is, is really about the concept. It's not about the sensation itself. It's this um, looking through a lens that now projects onto that experience all of our uh, judgments, all of our uh, comparisons, all of our past interpretations and understanding, which could be accurate or inaccurate. And so the idea is that rather than being behind the concepts, having that experience, move your attention to the doorway of the senses. So sit with eyes open or closed, and certainly a quiet space or nature or something is most helpful. But place your attention right at the doorway of the senses. So as that information is coming in, color, texture, form, sound, you know, whatever you're sensing in your skin, a breeze or temperature, just feel that. Just feel that. And, and the more you do it, the more you'll start to realize it's really incredible. And, you know, it, and it's always there. And that takes us into a deeper appreciation of the present moment, which is to say a deeper appreciation of life. It's not just this psychological storyline that I'm playing out, trying to be successful or somehow through the external world create a sense of value internally. Wow, thanks for that, Jeremy. So the two major highlights there would be to slow down. A simple way you can do that if, if someone's listening and driving in their car or watching online, just um, exhale, make the exhale a bit longer and feel the exhale, just feel the body. And then the other thing is, is the witness, um, you called it witness awareness, and that's kind of like you, you, you're usually enmeshed in the doing. Um, and, and instead you're saying maybe kind of zoom back and see that that's separate from you in a way. Like you can watch the, the movements of the mind maybe. And, and then you sit, really tune into the senses. The same way people will sit at the edge of the ocean and just be taken into this deep sense of calm because they're just taking in the, the expansiveness of the ocean or the sky or the sunset or clouds or whatever it is. It's that just um, a calm sense of receptivity to what's present. Okay. And tell me this as a, a longer term practitioner. Um, does it take a while to develop faith in this? Because I know beginning meditators and myself included, <laughs> you, you think it's boring you think that where it's at, because you've been doing it your whole life, you think where it's at is busyness. You know, getting that job, get, just doing that next thing, uh, that next thought. It always seems so sexy and so interesting and so juicy, right? Your thoughts just seem like where it's at. Uh, but over the years, the more I meditate, I see that where the real juice is and the real joy is, is just slowing down. And wow, like I just, I'll note hearing, hearing or seeing, seeing. A sensing, sensing what it feels like to have a body, and, and man, it is, it's beautiful stuff. Uh, it's like submerging you know, like, yourself into a hot tub, um, and you can do that in any moment. Yeah. So what, you know, does it take a while for people to get, you know, make that transition, or what's, what, what, how do you feel about that part of it? Should we have faith that if we keep trying this, that's going to seem like where the game is? I mean, has that happened to you? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, you know, Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras talks about faith and that there's not a, a blind sense of faith, that you're believing something that's intangible, but that you're believing the endeavor is worth it. That, that and I don't mean the endeavor of success, material success, but the endeavor of the spiritual quest, that, well, gosh, if I, if I spend time doing whatever I love doing, that might be some kind of action, or it might be, you know, camping in nature, or, or floating down a stream, or 
if I'm doing something that takes me beyond my, my life storyline, I get a sense that there's a much bigger picture than me, Jeremy Wolf, just going through my agenda trying to accomplish things that you know, it goes back to that sort of cosmic experience that we're, we're spinning on a planet you know, in a solar system, in a universe that we really have no concept of size or dimension or of, you know, personally. Um, we just sort of have these conceptual ideas of what that's like, but we start to sense that there's something much deeper and much richer. And what's key is to use whatever method initially gives you that sense of awe or brings you back into that state of um, sacredness. Sacred meaning that, that this moment or whatever I'm experiencing is extremely wonderful and beautiful and priceless. And in the beginning, when we sit down to meditate, it can be very challenging because we're thinking, well, gosh, my mind will not sit still. And what, what's, what's the point? I'm sitting here for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and there's just like movement of thought. I'm thinking about past, I'm thinking about future. Oh, wait, I'm supposed to be meditating. Oh, there's more thoughts. Oh, I'm supposed to be meditating. <laughs> so we go in and out of that experience. And what a lot of people don't, don't recognize is that getting the mind to focus on something, first of all, use, use, use a technique. Rather than just trying to get the mind to be still, give it an object for meditation. And most methods of meditation do, essentially, whether it's the breath or the sensation of the body or an internal image or even an external image or a mantra or various things. But have an object that you can tie the mind to. Um, and know that the first stage, the first stage of meditation is concentration. So when people say, I, I can't meditate, I was sitting there and I had a moment where my mind was like focused and then it wasn't focused. And, and, and maybe it's one second, three seconds, 10 seconds. That's the first stage of meditation. So the practice of corralling the mind into a single stream, which by the way, it makes the mind far more important. And by the way, we all do at some level in our lives. Um, we, we can channel a deep sense of focus. The key is to um, do that in such a way that there's a lessening of our disengagement, our identification with all of the thought streams that are moving through the mind. So however we can tap into a deeper sense of, again, awe or reverence for life, it's, 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 the, it's the most effective doorway for recognizing there is something more. And well, who is this me that has now accumulated all these memories? And who is this me that has this goal of accomplishing whatever it is? And who is this me that has really developed this personality? Um, what lies beyond just these constantly changing aspects of my body, my emotions, and, and my sense of self? And, and I think when you start to have a deeper reverence for life, that that sense of faith really accompanies it naturally. So it's not that well, my teacher said this will work, so I believe it, but I don't know. It's not working for me. But it's, you know, the idea that it, it, there, it, there is more available than certainly what our Western culture has emphasized. And even having faith that that might be true um, is enough to, to start the journey, to start the quest. And anytime you have an experience that's a little deeper, a little more at peace, um, or you feel a sense of joy that's non-circumstantial, you start to really touch that. Fantastic. So faith is built not necessarily from your teacher saying, trust me, this will work, but more from your own experience and spending more and more time. Absolutely. You know, just if, if you need to know that enough, of, of not, enough people are doing it, that it works, enough people are saying, hey, this works, do it, and know that that's the case. So give it a shot. <laughs> cool. Now, I was wondering, uh, you teach, um, you know, immersions and, and workshops and yoga teacher trainings all over the place. Um, what would you say to someone who goes to yoga class regularly and they want to take that next step, but they have a family or their, their career is very full, um, and they might, they might be on that fence of like, shoot, should I justify this time? Should I take this next step? 
So I guess, could you speak to the benefits of spending a weekend with you at some hot springs or, or committing to your first 200-hour yoga teacher training? Uh, I guess it does kind of come back to faith a little bit, like, you know, just, just help them take that leap, you know? It, it can be, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my advice would be if you're considering it, then then do it and then, then make the time, take the leap. The thing is that the value of it, and back to this value thing, the value of what you're giving yourself, which is really what you're um, awakening in yourself, will be so cherished not only by you, but by your family, by your coworkers, um, by how you show up in the world. Um, the great thing about yoga classes is we can get a quick fix of whether it's slowing down, some degree of cultivating mindfulness perhaps, or some degree of self-awareness, um, or just recognizing that I'm doing something beneficial for me or for my body or whatever it is. Um, but when you when you when you're ready to go a little deeper and say, well, how can you know? People say yoga can change your life. Well, I mean, you know, if I see it as exercise only, I'm, I might be like, well, how can that happen? And then we start to realize the more attention we bring into even if we practice yoga as exercise, that that self awareness as it grows starts to reveal more conscious ways of operating and it starts to uh, illuminate perhaps unsupported ways of functioning. So if you find that, you know, my life is so full, my family, my job, my responsibilities, if you can do a weekend immersion, do that. If you can do some, you know, a week long event or even a month uh, at some point, or that you can enroll in a teacher training, the thing to remember is um, yoga we see it as a practice and we schedule it. We schedule it on our day, we schedule it on our weekend or you know, this certain time of year. Um, but the reality is it's a way of refining how you are in the world and where you place your attention, how you relate to all things externally and all things internally. And it really is about self-transformation. It really is about awakening those hidden aspects of yourself that have been um, somehow obscured by this quest for uh, material success or um, external happiness or whatever it is. Not to say those things are, aren't valuable, but that our culture has an external orientation where traditionally yoga had an internal orientation. And we're starting to see the value in that, fortunately. And the thing is, we need both. We live in the world, we need both. But external without the internal is going to be very hard to find balance. It's going to be very hard to find a true and lasting sense of peace or happiness. So taking the step into a deeper exploration of yoga in whatever form that is, it's really about giving yourself the time to slow down and shift your perspective. You know, I say it a lot in my yoga classes, um, perhaps the most powerful thing we could change in our lives is our perspective. Because we get locked into a specific way of looking at the world, and now we define the world and its value based on that perspective. And we often forget that there are infinite ways to view any given situation. And when we start to do that, whether it's through a significant book we read, whether it's um, something we do through yoga or through meeting new inspiring people. Um, everything starts to change when your perspective changes. And we start to realize that we could operate um, very authentically you know, in a way that's more in harmony with ourselves and, and the world around us. I'm glad you mentioned books there because... Um you know, pretty much no matter how, how active you are in your life, everyone has the, the, and that nice window, maybe when they wake up on a Sunday morning or um, when they go to bed, um, you know, to read a book. And uh, books are just like life-changing. It's like meeting someone, getting a teaching from someone you might not be able to meet in real life. Um, are there any books that you'd recommend to um, our listeners and people watching this online that want to, you know, lead their best life? And starting today, you know, what book can they read? Right, yeah, Early books are great, and you know that's even that would be another one of my recommendations for what can you do 
as a daily practice. Not it doesn't have to be read a book, but use reminders. Use reminders that pull you out of the rushing, um, the seeking, the reaching, um, even momentarily. It can be a quote, a paragraph, a book, whatever it is, uh, an audio talk, uh, you know, a quote from a calendar day or something, where it pulls you out of your, your storyline for a moment and has you just be in whatever way that is. Um, there's a lot of great books out there. Um, the one, I, I probably have a, a number one recommendation, and it's just because it's by a contemporary teacher that I feel speaks in a way that's so relatable and applicable in our modern culture, and um, that would be Eckhart Tolle. I consider him one of my teachers, even though I've never studied directly with him. I, I've read his books and have lots of audio talks and retreats, uh, audio from retreats and such with him. And I feel like he gets to the heart of it very quickly. And I like teachers that teach in such a way that most of the things they say, um, you can't argue with. <laughs> so, you know, take this information, you know, integrate it, reflect on it, and, and see if that's true. And you'll realize that it is. It's like, oh, well, this is the nature of how the mind functions. Oh, this is this is how the mind functions in a way that keeps me in a state of perpetual discontent or whatever it is. Um, but I would say probably my top choice. Um, I just finished rereading it actually a few weeks ago, and I'm just it, it's just so clear and wonderful. Is Eckhart Tolle's book A New Earth? Mm -hmm. It's so comprehensive. It's so accessible. And, you know, if, 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 if there are books that should be required as college curriculum that teach about how, how we can live or how the mind works, this would be one of those books that I think should be, it should be required. Any, anyone inhabiting a, a human body should be required to read this book because it's just that insightful and that clear. And... You know, a lot of a lot of my teachings and classes and workshops and such, I, I use. You know, I, I sometimes say there's two ways to empower people. One is to give them tools to make them stronger, and the other is to reveal what what makes them weak, um, what's disempowering, uh, show them what's disempowering. Them. And I feel like this book does just that in such a wonderful way. Um, I would say if someone's brand new to this idea of presence or mindfulness or meditation or spirituality, then maybe start with The Power of Now. Um, that's the, the book that precedes A New Earth, and it's an ex excellent launching point. And if you feel you're ready for more detail, more depth, um, then, then certainly go to A New Earth. I just think it says so much that needs to be said um, that our culture does not say does not teach, does not emphasize, and does not look at, look at. Aside from that one, you know, there's a lot of great books out there. I guess depending on what, what you're interested in, if you're looking, well, let's, let's say, going back to this idea of changing your perspective, I like books that make me question everything. And some books will do that. Um, but I specifically like books that cause me to question my perspective or look at things differently. And another one that's really been a part of popular culture for a long time, but I just finally got around to reading it recently, was um, Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's just, it's a short book, and it gets right to the heart of how we operate, and how we operate in such a way that's very dysfunctional. And, you know, if I had read that book a decade or so ago, it it would have given me some huge ahas. Um, since I've been studying this stuff for a while, it, it, it wasn't as big of an aha in the moment of reading it, but the way he languages everything and describes it, it's just like, yes, if this, this should be taught in schools. Why, like, why isn't this taught in schools? This is, it's just simple. And, um, you know, it has a lot to do with how the mind operates again, um, because our experiences are far less determined by our environment and far more determined by our thoughts about our environment, our thoughts about what's happening. I know you know this as a meditation practitioner, of course. 
And you know other books. I, I happened to just also uh, last year read Ishmael, um, which is a you know a different slant on per perspective changing, which invites the opportunity to look at our culture and how it's evolved differently. Um, so that's another one. Um, but I would say, you know, in the realm of Eckhart Tolle, read one or both of his books, and it's going to give you it's going to give you pretty much everything you need to launch your spiritual practice or take it much, much deeper. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the show, and, and I always ask everyone that, that comes on your best life, um, from all your experience in your life, from the Taekwondo to being a, a DJ to being a dad, yoga, you know, everything you've, you've experienced in your life, what are three things um, that someone could do today to help them really to start living their best life, like actionable things they can really, you know, start on today and, and use, and you know, in a concise little like kind of list format. You know, we've we've, we've touched on probably most of those. Yeah. Um, a little recap. That's fine. Yeah, the top three. <laughs> things of what I, what I would suggest or say. Um, one of them would be, and maybe I'll end up with three or four here, but one of them would be. Don't try and keep up with the world. <laughs> the, the world is not balanced. And if you try to keep up with the world, you're not going to be balanced either. And I think, I think we're, we're recognizing that. So, and I know many of us have families and work and responsibilities and lots of things going. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of doing. Um, but you have to make time for your practice, yourself. And maybe this would be point two, is that have a practice a daily practice, whether it's five minute meditation, 10 minute meditation, half hour, whether it's um, drinking a cup of tea uh, in, 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 the, in a park, uh, on your balcony, on your patio, um, where you're not thinking about what do I have to get done, but how nice this moment is, just this. Wow, I didn't even realize all the birds that were flying around or chirping or you know, just use your five senses, but you have to make time to nourish yourself. But the world's not going to do it for you. And if you put everyone else first and everything else first, what you're going to find is that you're stretched, you're imbalanced, um, potentially unhealthy, and, and ultimately unhappy. So whatever your daily practice ends up being, do that. Um, and, and prioritize your happiness. And I don't mean your goals um, that, that hold their endpoints in the distant future that you claim will make you happy, but in each day, um, do something or not do something uh, for a period of the day that really brings you happiness, that connects you, again, with something deeper than just these layers of responsibilities or this task list that we're tackling often from the moment that we awaken in the morning. So figure out how how can you how can you nourish your right to be happy in this moment as things are. And I mentioned before reminders are great. So somewhere in that list they would fit in. So one, what, what is, that? one is don't don't try and keep up with the world. A daily relaxation practice, some kind of just tuning in. You don't even have to call it meditation. Sure. And then um, prior number two, prioritize your true happiness, not just those things in the future. Right. Okay. And then what, what's number three? Oh, number three. <laughs> if, if you do one of those well, then then that's really it. But yeah. But uh, number three. Hmm. You know, like you could think of it like if you were, uh, this is your last chance to share some, you know, some helpful advice with people. You know, what, what are those things you'd say? Like, you know, you've already said so much. I, it's, there's a lot there. You know, it, it, it really shows up in the first two, but access quiet time or access stillness. The thing is, your perspective starts to change when when your awareness starts to expand, and that's that's really what we want. 
um, is for you to, in whatever way, disengage from the perpetual movement of life for whatever period of time so that you can recognize what really is important. You know, there's, there's, that, there's that recommendation, oh, live every day as if, as if it was your last day. What if you would die tomorrow? How would you live today? It's really a very profound technique. It's really a very profound way of welcoming the, the limitless wonder and joy that's available this day rather than saying well this day is not Friday or this day isn't you know next month or whatever and, and just really access a relationship to what's here where you're appreciating it while it's here. That, that, to that goes full circle I started with the Mother Teresa quote the quote of the day but one of her other quotes about stillness is uh, in an interview I asked Mother Teresa once um, what do you say to God when you pray? And what does he say to you? And she said, um, when I pray, I don't say anything. And, and what does God say to me? He doesn't say anything. If you don't understand that, you'll never get this. Right. And it was just like, what a, what a, what a, what a true statement that, that all the answers that we're looking for out there, trying to get and grasp and do, man, if you just slow down and, and get still, like you said, it's almost difficult to come up with three things because if you mention the one thing of being still, there's all your answers right there. But everything flows out of that. And, and you actually reminded me, because you started with that Mother Teresa quote about wearing a smile. And because, you know, from a yogic perspective, there's, there's doing and there's being. We don't deny doing. We live in a world of doing. But we, we, we need to cultivate being at the same time or create space for it. But, you know, how that comes back to the original quote is, the more you nourish yourself, the more you start to access a peace or a joy that's non-circumstantial, that doesn't uh, require certain conditions to be present, that becomes the place from which you start to function more and more. And, you know, the idea of wearing a smile or putting on a smile when you enter the world or interact with others, whatever you bring, into the world is going to shape every experience of the world. The more presence you bring, the more joy you bring, the more presence and joy you're going to see in others and your experience. So ultimately, what do we want to create? And in those moments of stillness, we get to answer that question consciously rather than habitually. And I think that's absolutely key. Is we want every choice to become conscious where I'm not doing this because I'm Jeremy Wolf and this is what I do, but I'm doing this because of how it can serve me and serve others and serve a much uh, bigger role uh, or way of being as I move through it. So I'm sure a lot of people listening or, or watching online are, are thinking, I would like to learn how to be more present. I, I'd, I'd like to learn to be still. And everything that you share from your yoga nidra to your yoga teacher trainings to your workshops and just your way of being i mean that's that's what it's all about um how can they learn more how can they get to know you better or, or come practice with you is there a website they can go to or there is yeah i've got a website um the address of that website is www.metameme.org which is m-e-t-a-m-e-m-e -E -E, metameme um, dot org slash Jeremy Wolf and that's J E R E M Y W O L F and on there um, you can find out my weekly classes that I offer around Denver um, the more extensive immersions and trainings that I offer like uh, yoga nidra teacher training and uh, retreats and other events including DJ events that, that I'll be offering as well Great. Well, thanks for your information, of course. So if people want to reach out and see maybe what's most appropriate, if they're at the beginning stages of their practice or they want to go deeper, I'm happy to have a chat about that and support of that. Great. And they can uh, probably send you an email through the site if they want to reach out. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for your time, Jeremy. I, uh, I really appreciate it. And um, I, may all this information be beneficial to uh, everyone that watches it. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. You got it.